Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight, the COVID-19 threat causes local Muslims to cancel a pilgrimage. Plus, fears over the virus hitting airlines hard. Their response to shrinking business and more from cranes. Meet Congressman Dan Lipinski and his three challengers in next week's primary election. A Chicago art gallery dedicated to healing trauma. And we'll also hear from Rick Steves on his new documentary on extreme poverty. But first tonight, Phil Ponce with more details on the newly confirmed cases of coronavirus in the state. Phil. Brandis and Paris, as of tonight, there are eight new cases of the coronavirus in Illinois, including the first two cases outside Cook County. These new cases include a Kane County woman in her 60s and a McHenry County teenager, bringing the total number of coronavirus cases in the state to 19. Governor Pritzker says health officials cannot determine the origin of these two unrelated cases. Each likely reflects so-called community transmission of the virus. As anticipated, we have reached the point where we are likely to see additional cases reflecting additional spread within the communities each day forward. Joining us with more about the virus is Dr. Susan Bleasdale. She's an infectious disease physician and the medical director of infection prevention and control at University of Illinois Health. Dr. Bleasdale, thank you for joining us. First of all, what is the latest on mortality rates? One here, different percentages, 2%, 3% thereabouts. What can you tell us about that? So some of those numbers of the 2 and 3% are related to the first cases that were found, and most of those were in mainland China, and then the cases outside of China. And they're related to the first cases that were discovered were acute, and they were more severe. Um, the, the likely mortality rate is probably lower than that because there's probably a larger number of people that are undiagnosed and that we probably have people that have a much milder illness that haven't been diagnosed. And so the WHO has some modeling that suggests the mortality may be closer to 0.5% um, if we look at what is likely the total population that may have, have this that n doesn't have significant symptoms. As you know, some people have been uh, in an attempt to maybe minimize the threat have said, well, the, co the common flu, the yearly flu kills more people. Is that uh, persuasive? So it's similar to the flu, but I would say it's hard to estimate what's the overall mortality or death associated with the flu. There are some estimates that say that it's around 0.1%. So this 0.5 is still significantly more. The flu varies year to year. There have been worse seasons where the mortality has been higher. We do know that the 1918 flu mortality was probably somewhere around 2%, but then on average we have lower years. There is a significant mortality associated with the flu. Last year, 60,000 uh, patients died from influenza in the United States. Hmm. So it, it, that's a big number. That's a significant risk, the, uh, the flu. As you may know, some high profile people are self quarantining. Uh, you've been asked this before, but just for the record, how do you know if you have it? So the symptoms of the coronavirus are, are typically things like a cold or the flu. So it's cough, um, runny nose, sore throat, fever, sometimes myalgias. There are some, sometimes, some patients have had some uh, stomach upset along with it as well. Uh, as you know, Vice President Pence is leading the, uh, the uh, administration's response to the coronavirus. There was a press conference this afternoon, and here's some of what he had to say about testing. As we continue to expand testing availability across the country, testing is now available at all state labs. By the end of this week, there will be more than 4 million more tests made available in jurisdictions around the country. 1 million are already in place. How does one know if uh, they should be tested? So right now testing, because as they are rolling out more of these tests, would be people that have symptoms that might be consistent and some uh, link to either travel or a known case or a severe pneumonia that doesn't have a cause. Sometimes uh, in years past when when confronted with the flu, uh, people say, well, it's, it's the seasonal flu, come summer, it's going to dissipate. Is that the expectation with coronavirus? I think that's the hope, right? As we have uh, in the winter time, in the cold, once we come together, there's dry air, you're in close quarters, people's nose run from the cold, things like that. Um, they have dryness in their mucous membranes that put them at risk for 
infectious disease, not just flu, but some other infections as well. So our, our hope is this, as things warm up and we have some of those multiple factors that lead to increased incidence in the winter, that maybe it might uh, decrease as it gets warmer. And yet, uh, have, haven't there been some countries that are warm weather uh, countries right now at this time of year where uh, this, is a, this still is an issue? Yes, there is, and so it's likely not to disappear as we get into the warm months uh, for us here in the United States, um, but maybe that might mitigate it in, to some degree. We sometimes see flu in the summertime, but not as much as we do in the wintertime. How about danger from food, say imported food, imported food? produce, for example? So that's really not a risk. You know, most of the, the transmission is really close contact with people um, that have the, the coronavirus. And so you can see from the cases that we have had so far in Illinois, you know, it's been close contacts of people that are household contacts, and that's been the, the at least the known community spread right now. Are there any uh, myths or misinformation that you see that you've seen about the coronavirus that you'd like to dispel? Yeah, so I think probably right now is, as we have more cases here in Illinois with the 19 cases, probably the big question is, I was exposed to an exposed to an exposed person, right? And does that put me at risk? And I would say no. And really it is trying to make sure that you stay away from people that are ill using that social distancing. If you are ill yourself, that you stay home and that you call your provider. You know, do you have symptoms? Do you have to be tested? Do you have any risk factor? That's probably the biggest myth is, I may have been around someone who mm. might have had it. Um, the Department of Public Health is actively working to identify contacts of any of the known cases. Every time they have a new case, they work to try to figure out where this person has been, who have they been around, so that they can um, identify those individuals for evaluation, for potential testing, and so forth. As you know, Italy has pretty much shut down the country. Uh, as, uh, as, as we look at what this country is facing, is that a prudent thing to do? So in Italy, they had a significant increase in the number of cases and in a very short period of time that showed that there was ongoing community spread. In the United States, as we are increasing our testing, right now we have most of the cases of the 19 that are here in Illinois have some travel connection. Now we have two, potentially three cases that have not a known um, uh, connection, but I think we don't have a, a significant number to increase that I think we're not at that point. Um, and that's what's been recommended by the Department of Public Health, not to shut everything down at this point. Although some companies are keeping their workforces home, uh, more, uh, more employees working from home and that sort of thing, is there a possibility that a month or two from now that this country will have wished that it had done something along the lines of what Italy has done? Um, you know, I think that it's hard to say, right? Um, I think if there's opportunities for decreasing large gatherings, that's probably the place to start. Um, I think the important part is to help to protect our, our population that is most vulnerable, right? So our elderly population, those with immune compromising conditions, trying to make sure that they, they um, avoid large gatherings and uh, make sure that they're protected. In general, for the public, it is trying to uh, avoid um, those that are ill, staying home if you're ill, washing your hands often is really important, avoiding touching your face without washing your hands, those are still good measures to help us to prevent transmission of this and any other uh, viruses or infection. Dr. Susan Bleasdale, thank you so much for the update. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. And later in the program, we hear from Chicago Public School CEO Janice Jackson on the district's response to the coronavirus. But first, Brandis, we go back to you. Phil, thank you. Concerns about the coronavirus have led many to change plans, even cancel vacations. This includes some local Muslims who were supposed to go to Saudi Arabia over spring break, but not just for fun. Amanda Venicky has that story. It's the mid-afternoon prayer at the Muslim Community Center in Morton Grove, where a ritual similar to this happens five times daily. Thousands of worshipers may attend the special service each Friday afternoon. No matter what, they're always in the same direction, facing Mecca. That's pretty much the epicenter of all Islam. So wherever any, any Muslim, regardless of race or language or background, they always face Mecca. So it's, it's of extreme importance. And when we go there, we're all gathering together, regardless of where we're from, we're all gathering together to worship God. 
Every Muslim is expected to visit Mecca once in his or her lifetime in a pilgrimage called the Hajj. Imam Ibrahim Kader was planning to lead a group of congregants on a scaled back mini pilgrimage known as the Umrah later this month. Part of the idea is to establish a connection with the Holy Land, um, to understand the legacy that's left behind and the history. A lot of people grow up Muslim and they're not really familiar with the little nitty-gritty details. The significance for many, I mean, for Muslims is that we believe that this is an invitation from Allah. It's an invitation from God. So when you're, the opportunity arises to go, it, you start looking at it through a spiritual lens. If things had gone as planned, Arjaman Khan would be in Saudi Arabia with her family right now. Actually, my brother planned this for my parents, and then when my sister and I found out, we were like, oh, we definitely want to get in on this too. And so uh, we were going to take my parents, who haven't been there in over 30 years, so this was supposed to be a really uh, special trip for them. Instead, Khan spent the day at the MCC in Morton Grove. With the spread of the novel coronavirus, Saudi Arabia has restricted travel, including to holy sites like Mecca. We just decided as a family that it would be best to cancel and go at a later time. Um, just when we knew that our safety was in, in danger as well as being able to perform the ritual. So we are going all this way. Dr. Basir Kazi's family had likewise been booked to go on Umrah later this month, but decided to scrap it. It's not if we could go. The question is, should we be going? Kazi says his teenager had already asked her aunts and uncles what they wanted her to pray for there on their behalf. I think she took it the hardest out of all of the kids. Um, but it's, I think, being conscientious of others is part of our faith. And that, I think, is important, and that's what I try to teach the kids. We're, not, we're doing this for others, right? We're doing this because we don't want to promote the spread of disease. As for his five- and seven-year-old, he's teaching them the right way to wash their hands, like a surgeon would. I'm like, okay, I'm going to watch. I want you to do this. So now they both compete. So they take their soap and they're doing this. I go, no, no, you missed your creases here. You missed your fingernails underneath there. Fear of the unknown, like what might happen with coronavirus, can cause anxiety. And on those occasions, people of any and all faith often seek guidance, including from their spiritual leaders, like the imam here at the MCC. It's mostly about how do we make sense of this. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a test. Life is a test. Things happen. There's ups and downs. Uh, how do we uh, come to terms with what we believe to be destiny? The way that I look at it is that, you know, God is the best of planners. If Allah invited us, then, you know, the invitation might just be delayed. You know, we can go at a later time where it's safe and we can actually complete this journey uh, properly and be able to go to all the holy sites. There's no way to know what path the coronavirus will take, and there's no telling when Saudi Arabia will lift those travel restrictions. There's some concern it will carry over until the end of July, when the Hajj is supposed to take place. Most of those would-be travelers are still hoping to get to Mecca just at another time, but no solid plans. Everyone I talked to was able to get a refund this time around, but these trips can get really expensive. Khan tells me that during the Hajj, there are some travel agencies that charge 15000 up to even $50,000 a person, Brandis. Wow, Amanda. So we saw some people at the mosque. What restrictions are not in place? So Khan says that it has been really surreal to see that grand and mosque in Saudi Arabia in Saudi Arabia that's typically full of worshipers virtually be empty now that Grand Mosque is partially reopened but you saw on that video perhaps that there are circular barricades that cordon off the Kaaba that's that large black brick structure and typically Muslims will try to touch or even kiss it but due to coronavirus concerns that's why you have those barricades touching it is off limits. Now, Khan also told me that her family had canceled this trip to Saudi Arabia because also the country has banned travel from Mecca to the Prophet's Mosque, which is in Medina, and that defeated the purpose of the trip as well. Of course, so is the mosque itself making any changes due to coronavirus? Nothing outside of what we have been talking about since coronavirus really became a thing that is encouraging anybody who doesn't feel well to skip services, lots of hand washing. In fact, that is part of the prayer. It, it oftentimes 
friends anyway, but uh, also you, I saw while I was visiting there custodians that were cleaning the mosque. Rugs are cleaned daily, but individuals are welcome to bring their own prayer rug, given that, you know, your face leans down and touches it. We have seen religious leaders of other faiths make some changes due to coronavirus concerns. I have a friend, she is Greek Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, and she attended church services on Sunday, and this was posted there. This is typically a time when you would touch or kiss icons, and instead parishioners were told to bow instead, and her priest handed out the bread for communion out of a ladle instead of just out of his hands. And then we've also seen the Catholic Archdiocese of Chicago issuing COVID precautions, and those include things like requiring priests, deacon, and altar servers to wash their hands before and after mass, and then also worshipers are told to refrain from touching one another, that whole shaking your hand during the sign of the peace and no holding hands during the Lord's Prayer. Lots of new habits, Amanda. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have more coronavirus coverage online, including the story of the Food and Drug Administration issuing warnings to companies claiming to treat or prevent coronavirus. That's at WTTW.com slash news. And now to Paris shots and the latest of our Illinois primary candidate forums recorded late last week. Illinois' 3rd Congressional District has long been a Democratic stronghold, but in recent years, the Democrat representing it has been under fire by a challenger to his ideological left. The district, which covers parts of Chicago's southwest side as well as some west and southwest suburbs, has four Democrats facing off in this month's primary election. And joining us now in ballot order are those candidates. Marie Newman, a LaGrange business owner who ran unsuccessfully in the 2018 primary. Rush Darwish, a Palos Hills resident who owns a media production company. Incumbent Congressman Dan Lipinski, who took office in 2005, succeeding his father, who held the seat beginning in 1983. He's also a former teacher and engineer. And Charles Hughes, an operation mechanic with NICOR Gas and a former precinct captain for Congressman Bill Lipinski. And before we begin, we should note that this is not a formal debate with opening or closing remarks. Each candidate will not necessarily get the same questions. And while answers are not being timed, I may interrupt in an effort to cover as much ground as possible. And I thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Lipinski, I'll start with you. Uh, Congress recently signed off on an $8 billion funding package to tackle coronavirus. How has the federal government's response to this been? Well, it has not been good for, from the start. Uh, I'm glad we've come together to pass this $8.3 billion. House, Senate, Democrats, Republicans, President agreed to it. But the, uh, the failure to get the testing kits out, like was promised, has uh, really been a problem that in, this needs to get fixed very, very quickly. Uh, we're facing a real potential uh, crisis here. So I'm hopeful that it's going to get better. But uh, you know, we will see. I'm not sure the CDC was prepared for this. Ms. Newman, how should this money be dispersed in Illinois? Yeah, so the good news is that uh, Governor Pritzker and Mayor Lightfoot have a very good strong plan uh, available to us. So in the absence of the ill preparedness of the Trump administration, we do have um, opportunities here. But the two most important things are to get those testing kits ready to go and out the door and available to everyone and then simultaneously working on the vaccine. Mr. Darwish, the government's response to this so well, far? Well, I think the $8 billion is definitely a step forward. But at the end of the day, anytime you have Donald Trump and you have Pence working together and when it comes to the health of human beings in this country, it really scares me. It's one of the reasons I'm running. The idea that they're the ones in charge of something that could be very dangerous, I think all of us, not just government, have to pay very, very close attention to Mr. it. Mr. Hughes, did the president drop the ball on this? No, we shouldn't put bipartisan in the coronavirus. We all need to work together because it's America's lives. All right, Congressman Lipinski uh, on health care, the Supreme Court will consider uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act again. If it is overturned, what would you replace it with? Well, I, I think we have to have something similar to the Affordable Care Act, but the Affordable Care Act I have worked over the last 10 years to, to make that better. It's not affordable enough right now, so we have to make it more affordable for people. But there's a lot of other things we need to do to bring down costs in our entire health care system. If you go to Lipinski uh, for congress.com slash health care, I lay my plan out there for how we're going to lower prescription drug costs. What about coverage for people with pre-existing conditions? Well, that, that, that is critical, and that's something as a type 1 diabetic for over 30 years, I know how important that is. And so I've consistently voted to make sure we protect that. Uh, we have voted to, to do that uh, last year in, in the House. The House Democrats passed that. We didn't get that through the Senate, unfortunately, like many things. But uh, that is 
probably the most critical thing we do. Marie Newman, you've supported Medicare for All, uh, candidate Bernie Sanders' plan. What do you say to those who are wary of... Correct you there, the Medicare for All, there's eight proposals out there. It's not there's eight proposals. Okay, Medicare for All. What do you say for those uh, who are wary about losing their private insurance? So here's what we know. Study after study after study demonstrates it's the only way we're going to bring costs down, uh, allow for choice of doctor, and preserve quality of care. I like existing programs. You know why I like existing programs? Because they're tried and true and practical. Medicare for all, Medicare can be made better and made available to everyone and roll it out in a measured, methodical way. Would that I'm mean a the, former management consultant would that and mean I would the know end how to of do private that. insurance. Not necessarily. Um, I think that we can do this in a way where we provide it to everybody over a period of time and measure it out. So the first thing we have to do is get the price of uh, prescription drugs down. Yeah, yeah, well, there's for no all doubt, all and I'm, I'm going to jump on this really insurance. quick. At the end of the no day, we'll, we have a situation here, and I've called this from day one of this campaign, extreme doesn't win campaigns, and that's what I stand for. You have to have a choice. At the end of the day, everyone should have a choice when it comes to their health care coverage. That means, yes, if you like your private insurance provider, you like, if you're with the union, you like the insurance you're getting, you should keep it. At the same time, if you don't have access for insurance, there should be a government option, and that's why I say it's Medicare for all who want it. Now, Rep Lipinski voted against that the first time around when it came to uh, the Affordable Care Act, which I find it interesting that now he's saying he supports it. And on the other hand, you know, what Marie's going to do is take away the option of having a private insurance or for somebody to have a choice. We need somebody who's down the middle that's going to make sure everyone has an option when it comes to their health. Congressman Lipinski, you wanted to weigh in on the notion of, of Medicare for All. Well, Medicare for All clearly is gets rid of all, all private insurance. It's a plan that would cost $32 trillion over 10 years, it required the doubling of every federal tax to pay for it, take away private insurance from 170 million people. It's not Medicare whatsoever because Medicare right now, if you're on Medicare, you have uh, Medicare Advantage as an option. More and more seniors are taking that up. That is private insurance, which is providing better, more coverage for seniors than uh, traditional Medicare. Would you support a public option? I, I, I definitely do support a, a, a public option. Uh, that is in my, my plan. A public option such as what they have done in Washington State recently, and we'll see how that does, how that moves forward. Uh, I have, uh, I support giving incentives to states to do that. Ms. Newman, um, sure. legislatively it might be difficult to pass a, a complete overhaul mm -hmm. of the system. Would you support a public option if that were what was on the overhaul. table? So Medicare has existed for 55 years. It's a tried and true program that works very well. If we take it, make it better vision, dental, long-term care, and extend it to everybody over time and start with reducing the price of um, drugs, it's the only, and I repeat, only plan that has been studied study after study after study it's the only one that brings costs down right now if we go with Obamacare it will double the price that uh, Rep Lipinski just uh, shared with us. Mr. Well, Hughes, I need to get you in. I want to I address this subject Obama did a real good job starting out with ACA I'm very proud of him I support Joe Biden because he's gonna follow through my plan is DC Health Link which the lead in Washington the Congress and the Senate that to have D.C. health care like our Congressman Lipinski. I want to bring it to the American people. It's about a $3 billion process that's already in place. We can add it to the people All right, of I need, America. I want to move on to the issue of abortion because that's what has gotten so much attention in this district. Uh, Congressman Lipinski has signed a letter uh, urging Supreme Court justices to review Roe versus Wade. Is it, is it prudent um, legal precedent to overturn a 50-year legal precedent? Well, um, I'm in the U.S. House of Representatives. I'm not on Supreme Court, so I don't have any impact whatsoever on Roe v. Wade. What we're talking about, what has just been uh, heard arguments in the Supreme Court, was a Louisiana law that was written by an African-American female Democratic uh, representative down there to say the same standards need to apply to abortion clinics as apply to other ambulatory surgical centers. The only thing that we vote on in the House of Representatives uh, such as we did last week. We voted on a bill that would say if a baby is born during a attempted abortion, that baby needs to be given the same care that any baby born of that term would be given. And I support that. Uh, people like, you know, the groups that have supported Marie Newman with over $2 million in this uh, do not support that. That is a radical position. 77% of Americans say that that baby should be cared Con for. Congressman, you may not be on the Supreme Court, but you do, you do have a platform and voice. Would you urge the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade? Well, 
it, uh, I don't think that, that matters. I am pro-life. There's no question about that. And I do think that this is something that we should decide through legislatures. Uh, Marie Newman, is there room in the Democratic Party for pro-life voters? Yeah, no, so um, it's not my job, it's the voters' job, right? So we just need to be in alignment with our district. The third district is 71% pro-choice, and I'm in alignment with the district. I trust women. I, I don't, I, the 71% that Ms. Newman talks about, I don't see how that is, is possible. That may be Democratic primary voters, uh, but it's certainly not the entire district. We have to, and I know Rep Lipinski's brought this up many times, that he says one out of three Democrats are pro-life. And, uh, and I find that to be uh, bizarre because I think Rep Lipinski continues to forget about the other 66% that are Democrats and he's not in line. And also I want to say this with both of my opponents here. Uh, I think this is a very important issue, but both of my opponents uh, are, are constantly bringing up the issue here. And I really feel that uh, this is a critical issue and we have to address it. But at the end of the day, I think what we need to focus on are all the issues. And we also need to stop, you know, trying to bring in what I call special interest and PAC money. Both of my opponents are taking millions of dollars and they're putting their ads out there against each other. And I think at the end of the day, the middle class, uh, the ones who are working every day are the ones that are being forgotten because of issues that, you know, sometimes we're not focusing on all the big pictures. Congressman, um, um, uh, Illinois has passed a law that should Roe v. Wade be overturned, it would still be legal and accessible in Illinois. Do you support Illinois state law trumping the federal law in that instance? Well, no, I, I don't believe and I think most people do not believe on we should have abortion on demand up until birth. That, I believe, is an extreme position, uh, and that is something I do not support. But I think a majority of people don't support that. Taxpayer funding for, for abortion, that's not something that even so Democrats... should Illinois state law trump in this, the federal law? Uh, well, it's going, to do, it's going to do that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hughes. I've got a different take on it. Women and their doctors should have private discussion on, on birth. It's between a woman and a doctor, not between government and all men. Women don't tell men what to do with their bodies. Men shouldn't tell women. I think what it is, the big issue in this district is jobs, education, health care. And I want to talk about student loans a second. I want to get rid of the interest rates on student loans. We're starting our kids off on debt. The debt of the problem is they start the second semester of college and already $150,000 in debt, and they didn't even graduate. It's, it's and an you're important talking issue. about abortion, but what about the people living in America? What about the people in the district that are alive? They got real issues now, and you're worried about someone having an abortion. Well, there's a lot of issues we have to get to. Uh, Ms. Newman, you ran two years ago. You came within 2,000 votes. Why are you running again? Because I think that um, the district wants me to run. So um, before we ever ran, the first time we did an exploratory, and it was clear that they were not satisfied with representation, uh, particularly around uh, things like health care and immigration and jobs and transportation. So when I decided to run again, or thought I would, um, we did another exploratory, and it was clear that the district wanted me to run again. So I am here because we, everybody wants health care for all. It is really clear. I've done 309 meet and greets, and every time somebody tells me a health care story. So I am here to be a worker, be in Congress, and get health care done. Mr. Darwish, um, Ms. Newman and Congressman Lipinski ha have the highest support in polls, have, have a lot more money behind them. What is your path in this election? My path is to talk to the voters. And my path is also not only to go for the win, and whatever the outcome is, everyday people need to run. I come from the middle class. I'm a small business owner. And when I see an urgency, when I see and I look at Washington, D.C., and I see wealth and privilege smother all of Washington, D.C., it sends a very strong message that we need new voices in Washington, D.C. We need a new energy. And that's why I'm running. And we have to give everyday people an opportunity to run. I will tell you this. If we could eliminate special interest groups, if we can eliminate PACs, I promise you, the best candidate is not in this room. But if we eliminate them, we're going to find the best people to represent us in Washington, D.C. Congressman, another issue, there are uh, undoubtedly undocumented immigrants in the 3rd Congressional District. Do you support Chicago's status as a sanctuary city? Well, I have been, contrary to what has been put out there uh, by the, the Newman campaign, you can read more about uh, at misleadingmarie.com about things that Ms. Newman has put out there that are not the case. I support the, the DREAM Act. Uh, when we have had, I voted for the DREAM Act, co-sponsored last year. I support comprehensive immigration reform. And when we have had bills come up in the House of Representatives that 
when the Republicans were in charge, they wanted to punish sanctuary cities. I have always opposed those. So, so Chicago should still receive federal funding and not have that withhold I, as a sanctuary city? I have voted that way, yes. M M Ms. Newman, um, Congressman Lipinski says that, uh, that you've misrepresented his record on that. Here to respond to that? I have not. He voted against the DREAM Act in 2010. That's clear. That's in the record. So, but what's really important here is I think we have to stop the separation of families. We have to protect our DREAMers and support DACA and DAPA and make sure that um, we have humane and dignity um, as our, our guideposts in all that we do and reverse all these horrifying uh, Trump policies. I want to go down the line. Uh, sanctuary City, Mr. Hughes. I support DACA. I believe that everyone has, should have a path to citizenship because they follow the rules. They're part of society. And but they, specific sanctuary city sanctuary where city? in Chicago, should Chicago stay a sanctuary city? I think they should. Mr. I, Darwin? Absolutely. The, the American dream is built on for people to come into this country, come to the city of Chicago, and make sure people have a chance to succeed. Absolutely it should be. I back it 100%. I'm the child of immigrant parents, and of course I stand for this. Uh, Ms. Newman, um, Congressman Lipinski sits on the Transportation Committee in right. Congress, the Aviation Subcommittee. It's a lot of clout. What yeah. do you say to view, uh, voters who don't want to lose that kind of clout to bring home funding to the district? They won't lose the clout. So very likely they would put whoever wins the, this race would be on the Transportation Committee. And because I have transportation background, I've been a management consultant, I've worked in uh, the transportation space before, um, I would be ready to go. I have studied the district. We, I have a transportation plan right on my uh, website, marineumanforcongress.com. And the reason that we took time to do that is because the district has never had a real plan. So that's why it's there and I would be ready to go on day one. Congressman uh, Lipinski, uh, Mike Maddox, Again, resident of the 3rd Congressional District. He's the head of the Illinois Democratic Party. Um, there are all kinds of investigations that, that have mentioned his name. He's had Me Too problems. Do you support Mike Madigan as the head of your party in Illinois? As long as the uh, members of the party want him, yes, he should still be head of the party. Ms. Newman, Mike Madigan is chairman of the Democratic Party in Illinois? I think it's time for him to go. So you would support someone else? Yeah. Mr. Darwish? I'm going to be honest with you. At this stage, what I'm trying to do is engage new voters into the process. And as long as he's fair to these new people and make sure that everyone gets an opportunity when it comes to government, uh, he's not a concern to me right now whether I want him or not. Okay, There's too much work that needs to get last done. Last question down the line. Uh, for President uh, Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders? So um, candidates don't endorse. I'm very concentrated on my race, and I think that whoever is the nominee will be 1,000 times better than Trump. Is this the sentiment I'm going to get from everybody? Joe Biden. Joe Biden. 100%. Okay. Congressman? Uh, I've not endorsed anybody. Uh, I, on many things, I would lean towards Joe Biden, but the first press conference I had as a member of Congress was with Bernie Sanders uh, against a bad trade deal. So he has definitely has some, some good points, but... Look, I, I don't support uh, Medi Medicare for all, and I think that's a big issue right now for and voters. Mr. Darwish, Too close a call, but I do vote blue no matter who. However, as, as we speak, Bernie Sanders has the edge when it comes to human rights and equality. I'm going to pay attention to that. We'll have to leave it there. My thanks to all of Thank you, you for you. being Thank here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And there's more from these candidates and many others in the 2020 Voter Guide to the primary election. Hear from candidates in their own words why they think they are the best qualified and where they stand on the issues. And that's going to be at WTTW.com slash Voter Guide. And there's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight podcast and subscribe. And here's more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Chicago Public Schools says the latest round of testing for students exposed to coronavirus at a Portage Park High School has returned negative results and the district has no plans to close any additional schools. During a news conference today, Schools Chief Janice Jackson explained how the district is exploring plans to use e-learning should schools need to be closed. We can't just solve for Vine. It's possible that these cases could spread and other schools could be impacted. We also have to take guidance from the Illinois uh, State Board of Education. It's not something that the district can just enact without changes um, at, with ISBE. What we are prioritizing are enrichment activities, which is within the district's control. Jackson also says CPS is working with the Greater Chicago Food Depository to distribute enough food for three days to the families from Vaughn Occupational quarantined. More on the impact of the coronavirus on airlines just to have trains. Advocates are proposing to restrict the use of solitary confinement for state prison inmates. Representative LaShawn Ford is announcing the Anthony Gay Isolated Confinement Restriction Act. 
talked to a former inmate who was held in solitary confinement for more than 20 years, including 15 years of a prolonged sentence as punishment for behavior that his attorneys say was caused by the confinement. They say during that time he was denied appropriate mental health treatment, leading him to brutally mutilate himself at an emotional press conference this morning. I was trapped in a cell. Smaller than the size of a parking space. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> the law would win consecutive days in a 180 day period. It would allow inmates to have access to group therapy classes, job assignments, and more confinement. It would also require quarterly reporting on the use of isolation. A new report says the evaluation of Chicago Public Schools is helping students learn. The research from the University of Chicago Consortium on School Research says 83% of teachers and 93% of administrators said the process helped improve classroom instruction. Across the district, while most teachers were satisfied with the process, there was variation across schools. Researchers say this may indicate stronger buy-in at some schools and the need for improved coaching skills for administrators at others. As for the weather tonight, a 70% chance of rain and snow after midnight with a low around 35 degrees. Tomorrow, a chance of some morning rain, then cloudy with a high near 51. And now to some of today's top business headlines. Here's Crane Chicago business editor and wire. Brandis, United Airlines is warning that the coronavirus shock could rival the financial fallout from 9-11. The Chicago-based carrier tells investors its worst-case scenario calls for revenue to drop as much as 70 percent in April and May before rebounding slightly, yet lower than normal by the end of the year. By comparison, U.S. air travel revenue fell 40 percent in the two months after the September 11th terrorist attacks. Rivals Delta and American Airlines are following United's lead, mirroring the capacity cuts that United announced last week. Delta will slash its domestic schedule by as much as 15 percent and international flights by 25 percent. American, meanwhile, says it will reduce U.S. service by more than 7 percent in April and cut foreign flights by 10 percent for the peak summer season. Meanwhile, Fifth Third Bank is fighting an allegation similar to one that hit Wells Fargo Bank in 2016. In a lawsuit filed in a Chicago federal court, the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau alleges that Fifth Third Bank ran a system of staff incentives that prompted employees to open accounts in customers' names without their knowledge or consent. Fifth Third, one of the biggest banks in the Chicago market, is vowing to go to trial. And finally, tonight Chicagoans get a chance to see detailed sketches of the Twin Towers proposed to be built on the long dormant construction site of the old Chicago Spire. Related Midwest has just unveiled a scaled back plan for two residential high rises as it angles for aldermanic approval of this scaled down blueprint. In the revised plan, Related Midwest proposes towers rising 875 and 765 feet with about 1,100 combined residential units. Those heights were trimmed from a previous proposal, and a hotel was also removed after objections from neighbors. For Crane Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Ann DeWire. Back to you, Brandis. Thanks, Ann. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, travel guru Rick Steves tells us about his new documentary on extreme poverty and confrontational artwork that offers healing and therapy. But first, we go to Paris and Phil with some thoughts about why your support of this program is so important. Brandis, thank you, and we have a lot more Chicago Tonight coming up, but we want to take a few minutes to ask you to support WTTW in Chicago tonight. You know, there's so many issues that come at us every day, whether it's the coronavirus, whether it's the stock market, whether it's Chicago's response in schools to the coronavirus, and we try to help people put all that together and give it some context. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but first, when you become a member of WTTW, you've got a couple of great options for gifts. Gene Honda has more. Well, thanks, Paris. We have some wonderful ways to help support programs like Chicago Tonight here on WTTW. For $5 a month as a standard or for $60 annually, 
You can show everyone your support for this station with this WTTW baseball hat. It has the embroidered logo on there. It even has the PBS logo that you can see there. And yes, it is adjustable. Or for $10 a month as a standard, or for $120 annually, we'll say thank you by selling you the travel tumbler. Sending you the travel tumbler means you support Chicago tonight. It says so clearly on the mug there. And yes, it does keep your beverage good for hot or for cold temperatures. But you just heard Ann Dwyer with Crane Chicago Business. If you'd like more business news for $15 a month as a sustainer or for $180, we'll say thank you with a one-year print and digital subscription to Crane Chicago Business. Some wonderful ways for you to lend your support to all the information that you get here on WTTW. So call us at 773-588-1111 because your support makes all these great stories you hear on Chicago Tonight possible. All right, thank you, Gene. You know, Phil, uh, there's so much going on right now, coronavirus. The, there's, there's a lot of nervousness. There's a lot of tension in the community with the cases expanding. The stock market is very volatile. And, you know, it's a tremendous example of why this program is needed and essential in a time like this, because you have noise coming at you from all angles online and social media. Mm -hmm. But, you know, on this program, we're going to give these issues serious time, in-depth reporting, an analysis and guests like you had on coronavirus that are very well, well, trustworthy. Well, Dr. Bleasdale, for example, one of the things I asked her, as, 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 you, uh, as you heard, was is there information out there? Is there myths? And one of the things she said was people worried about having been in contact with somebody who'd been in contact with somebody who'd been in contact. That's the kind of information that people can use. It's the sort of thing that uh, is a service to people as we confront all these issues. And look, I mean, Election Day is upon us next week, so yeah. We, we do our best to keep people, uh, uh, to give people context. Uh, we certainly have a lot more election coverage coming up, probably a lot more coronavirus coming up. And, you know, this program's been around 30 years, and I think it's built up this, uh, this trustworthiness and credibility among viewers. And viewers know that when they come here that they're going to get in-depth reporting analysis that they can't get anywhere else. And providing free access to quality news coverage is core to our mission. Here's WTTW President and CEO Sandra Cordova Misek to explain how you can help. As a nonprofit newsroom, we rely on our members to keep our independent, commercial, and interest-free news coverage accessible to everyone in our community. I'm Sandra Cordova Misek, President and CEO of WTTW. I ask that you join thousands of members who offer their ongoing financial support to WTTW for in-depth reporting and analysis of our city and region. Support WTTW to keep independent, unbiased news strong and accessible in Chicago by making a donation online at WTTW.com or calling 773-588-1111. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. I'm Gene Honda, and you agree with all the things she said? Well, then now take the time and make the call at 773-588-1111. Call now and for $5 a month as a sustainer, we can say thank you by sending you this wonderful WTTW baseball hat, which is also a favorite of Jeffrey Bears, by the way. It's fully adjustable or $60 annually for $10 a month as a sustainer or for $120 annually. The travel tumbler with the Chicago Tonight logo on it keeps hot drinks hot, cold drinks cold. Or for $15 a month as a sustainer or for $180 annually, we'll say thank you by sending you a one-year print and a digital subscription to Crane Chicago Business. It's your support that makes Chicago Tonight come into your living room. Please call the number on your screen and support the program right now. Back to Paris and Phil. All right, thank you, Gene. Phil, some final thoughts before we wrap up here? Well, I'd like to think that uh, our program is relevant. Something new is coming at us every day. Something new is coming at you in terms of information. We hope we're a filter that you can trust, uh, someone, uh, a, a source to, to give you some clarity, and that's what we try and do every day, Paris. Ditto to all of that, Phil. Thank you very much. And we're back with Brandis and a look at a new documentary by travel writer Rick Steves, so stay with us.
More than 700 million people struggle to live on less than $2 a day. But PBS travel guru Rick Steves says there are innovative solutions across the globe that are changing that. In his new documentary, Hunger and Hope, Lessons from Ethiopia and Guatemala, Steves looks at different ways the two countries are increasing access to water, education and food. The documentary is airing here on WTTW March 26th at 9 p.m. Steve stopped by to record a conversation with us late last week. I began by asking him about how coronavirus is affecting his personal travel as well as his travel business. Well, anybody who's in tourism is having a miserable time right now. You know, we took 30,000 people to Europe on my Rick Steve's bus tours around Europe last year, 30,000, and it was just great. We were on a track to do better than that this year, but in the last month, you know, sales have completely stopped, and I can understand. Uh, people are nervous. Uh, the thing about coronavirus is we don't know if it's going to be old news in two months or if it's going to be worse in two months. So what I'm, I'm hoping to go to Istanbul. I've got my flight in April, and I'm hoping to go, but I'm not going to make my decision now. I'm going to wait until it gets closer. I'm going to find out what are the consequences of canceling my flight and so on, and I'll make my decision when I have to. But uh, right now, it's just, um, you know, I've been at this for 30 years, uh, you know, taking people to Europe and talking about tourism, and um, crises come and crises go. Uh, we don't know where we're going with this one, but my hunch is uh, uh, we'll get over it and it'll settle down and we'll be traveling again in, in a short period of time. But right now, let's just hope we figure this out. Is that the advice that you're following and, and what advice are you giving uh, your clients, your customers? Oh yeah, just don't panic right now unless you're leaving in the next month. Otherwise, just hold on and see what's happening as time goes by. Because really, it could be a whole different story in a month and it would be a shame to, to fold up your tent and, and end your travel dreams needlessly. On the other hand, you don't want to do anything risky. So, you know, there's, there's uh, several things to worry about. Are you going to get it? Uh, is it ethical for you to travel in the time when you might spread it? And do you want to go there if the museums are closed and you might not have flights getting you home? So these things are going to be sorted out and uh, we need to make that decision later on. Okay, so on to your documentary, Hunger and Hope. Why did you want to create this documentary? Well, I have this uh, wonderful job of going out in the world and getting to know people and, uh, and learning things. And uh, I find important topics that uh, caring, smart Americans may not fully understand because they haven't had the opportunity to travel. And one thing that's been in my uh, uh, concerns for decades is uh, what are the structures of poverty? Why are there hundreds of millions of people living in desperate poverty when there's so much affluence in the world? And uh, this is the year I decided I want to I want to explain uh, that you know you can fight hunger, you can fight extreme poverty because you love your neighbor or you can ignore that whole ethic and just fight it because you want the world to be more stable and safe. It doesn't matter, but we can fight hunger. We're not talking about getting rid of poverty. Half of humanity is trying to live on $5 a day, and you know that's just the way it is, I think. But 10% of humanity is living in this extreme poverty, and it's very realistic for the United States to continue taking a lead in fighting that. And what I wanted to do was go to Ethiopia and Guatemala to use those countries not as tourist destinations, but as classrooms, so we could learn what's happening in modern development aid. A lot of Americans are cynical about development aid, in part because uh, in the old days, development aid did make people dependent. Today's development aid is really smart. It makes people independent. It empowers women. Women. It's, it's got climate smart agriculture woven into it. It empowers people to work and sell things, to be in part of the global economy rather than to abandon their farms and move into the cities or try to get into the wealthy countries. So we wanted to make a one hour show. Thankfully on public television here on WTTW, we can respect people's intelligence, we can assume an attention span, and we can bring content to people driven not by a, a passion for keeping advertisers happy, but by a passion for taking caring, smart people, exposing them to important issues, and inspiring them to be engaged and make a difference. Give us a sense of uh, the kind of poverty that you saw. Well, I wanted to humanize what is extreme poverty. Um, it, this show is five minutes of desperation and 55 minutes of hope. That's why it's called Hunger and Hope, Lessons from Ethiopia and Guatemala. Extreme poverty is a dirt floor, a thatched roof, no windows, a fire on the floor, a, a dark environment filled with smoke, uh, it is no running water, it's no electricity, no access to health care, and no education. No understanding on the part of the mother, of the importance of hygiene and good nutrition for the children. If we can teach mothers uh, the importance of getting not enough calories, but the right calories in the first thousand days, that child will grow up not stunted. 
and if a child doesn't get the adequate nutrition, that child grows up stunted and they can never reach their potential. They can never produce as they should. So um, that's an example. The whole idea of empowering women these days, I mean, across the board, NGOs, non-government organizations, people in the trenches working to help people in the developing world, uh, you know, lift themselves out of poverty. Uh, across the board, people are recognizing that it is women who are the responsible ones and they need to be empowered. They need to be given education and, and they're, they're the ones that can spearhead this kind of development. Uh, historically, the men just piss it away, you know. So all over the place, women are taking the lead in this. Uh, we're not just giving people technology. We're, we're letting communities own this and be good stewards of it. And there's all sorts of what I call low-hanging fruits of development aid that make a huge difference. If a poor, uneducated person has a, a, a fire, an open fire on a dirt floor, they're consuming triple the wood they need to to cook for their food and, and get them heat. If they can get a modern stove, just an elevated stove that's more efficient, there'll be a lot less deforestation, there'll be a less respiratory diseases, and there'll be a community that can then grow. And we're just about out of time, about 15 seconds left. You've been a longtime advocate of marijuana legalization. It is now legal in Illinois. How do you think it's playing here? Well, we did this in eight years ago in Washington state, and uh, states every two years, every election season have been building on this. I've looked at Illinois' law. It's a very smart law. It's a very conservative law, and uh, there's no hunches now. The track record is there. As your governor know, and as your legislators have known for a long time, I was here a year or two ago helping out, raising awareness of this. But what we're talking about is not a pro-pot law. This is smart public health law. This is anti-racism. This is pro-civil liberties. This is get rid of a black market and turn it into a highly regulated legal market that generates a lot of tax revenue. I just talked to my governor who was not in favor of this eight years ago when we legalized. And uh, now he says, hey, Rick, I'm glad we don't arrest 8,000 people a year like we used to. I'm glad we took a billion dollar illegal black market that was enriching and empowering gangs and organized organized crime and turned it into a highly regulated highly taxed legal market and in my state my governor's getting 300 million dollars a year out of this tax revenue from what was an illegal black market and we're investing that in health programs and in drug awareness programs and I know Illinois is doing the same thing and plus Steve's hot take <laughs> you've got a great a very progressive approach to expungement which I think is a beautiful part of your law Rick Steves thanks for joining us as always Great to be here. And again, Rick Steves' documentary, Hunger and Hope, Lessons from Guatemala and Ethiopia, airs on WTTW Thursday, March 26th at 9 p.m. And we're back with more right after this. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. Chicago is home to an uncommon art gallery that's become an important place to explore artistic expressions of healing. Here's a look and fair warning, some of the artwork you're about to see may be considered graphic or upsetting. At the Awakenings Gallery in the Ravenswood neighborhood, there are wish-filled dreams and horrifying nightmares. It is the work of artists united by trauma. Our mission is to make visible the artistic expression of survivors of sexual violence. For us, that means people who maybe have experienced sexual violence firsthand. It also means family members, friends, loved ones. We hope to give all survivors a trauma-informed professional arts experience that they otherwise might not have access to. We have visual art exhibits, we have performances, music, theater, we have a literary magazine and a blog, so we've got a lot going on. In the permanent collection, one canvas looks at the fine line walked by survivors and their partners. Other works reveal the weight of enormous pain. I think a lot of people do remark on how dark some of the imagery is, but there's always a very healing story attached to it, which is why we really value the artist's statements to go along with the artwork so people can understand that they might be looking at something that seems very disturbing, but it was very, very healing for the artist. Artists come from Chicago and around the United States and as far away as Portugal. They include men seeking to reassemble their lives. We work very hard to make sure that men feel included in this conversation. Sexual violence is not a weapon of oppression that can be dismantled without men. And especially it's important to include male survivors in the movement because there are very, very few resources for them. Awakenings Gallery is now in its 10th year of breaking silences. It's a huge component of what we do, providing space and resources for people to tell their story as they want to tell it, for them to define 
survivorship in their own terms and through their own artistic medium. Um, that also means that sometimes survivorship looks really angry. Sometimes it can feel very stuck. Sometimes that artistic expression is full of joy and glitter on a canvas. We want to make sure that we are welcoming to artists from any skill level, which means we have very professional artists in the space that have exhibited before. We have art artists that have gone to school, and we also have people that have never created art in their lives. The art is therapeutic, but... We are not a clinical space, we're not therapists. A lot of people think we are art therapists, but our job here is to really showcase the art and create a community around healing through art. And there are hopeful outcomes in these creative endeavors. We also are really excited to see people who are able to say, my healing actually now looks at all the places where I find joy and all the people who've supported me along the way, even if that support has been imperfect or maybe at a different timing than that person wishes. Um, so there is, I think, a huge place for renewal and for people to feel like what maybe for a while was stuck or very fragmented has begun to grow again. Awakenings Gallery is a nonprofit supported by city and state art programs and private donors. You can see more of the artwork from Awakenings on our website. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. The four Democrats running to replace Dorothy Brown as circuit court clerk face off. And meet the Chicago company that hopes its seated electric scooter can give it a leg up. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Have a good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, serving Chicago as a personal injury law firm since 1984.